Well, today the feast of Saint Fidelis. You want to sit down, Right. Today the feast of Saint Fidelis of Smyrigna, <coughs> the martyrs of <coughs> the 1600s, born in 1577. One thing we notice is that <coughs> we think of the age of the martyrs as being the age of the first 300 years, but in fact, during the time when the world church was persecuted by Rome. But in fact, you'll discover that there are martyrs of every single age, including our own age, and we'll always be martyrs until the very ending of time. So the day of consideration is going to be here again in Massachusetts and Dudley here. And a few considerations in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We have the two people to consider the feast today, St. Fidelis. But we have also in the Holy Bravery as we're reading through this time of Paschal time, reading through the Acts of the Apostles. And there are two different men striving to be priests. And one of them is written in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. And in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, the... Uh, uh, I think it's just right there. Just put it right on the... That's the best thing, right? Yeah, and then... So, and then the, so the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, and then the... The, we read about Simon Magus today. Simon Magus, Simon was a magician and he deceived the people by his magic tricks and was very well uh, popular because of that. And then the apostles came to his place and they converted many people to the Catholic faith and it tells us, and Simon went and Simon listened to the apostles and he also believed and was baptized. So that Simon, when he went and met our, our Lord Jesus Christ, the apostles, he believed and was baptized. And they were all baptized that time, but none had yet been received the sacrament of confirmation or ordination to the priesthood. And so they were all baptized, Simon believed. And then they came, the St. Peter and St. John came, and they started to ordain priests. And they, and they received the Holy Ghost, and he saw the powers that the priests had. And he came, therefore, to St. Peter, and he said, Peter, I see the power that you priests have, and I want this power for me. And therefore, he offered money to St. Peter. And from this, we get the sin that is called after himself, which is the sin of simony. And the sin of simony is the sin of Simon, the magician, who decided to buy his priesthood to buy the religious gifts. And St. Peter said to him, Keep thy money, for you think the power of God can be purchased by money. But the power of God cannot be purchased by money. Therefore go back and repent for this wicked thinking. God's power does not come by money. It cannot be purchased by money. You need to repent and go back. And then Simon like a good Catholic, he said, Peter, pray for me. And if you do not go back, you will fall into the, into the power of the devil and will end in a horrible death, in a horrible way. He said, well, Simon, pray for me. St. Peter, pray for me that this does not befall me. And it's interesting that his name is Simon. For there is Simon who met Christ. And Simon that met Christ said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Then he was changed into St. Peter, the rock. There was another Simon that met Christ that we read about today, and he became baptized, and he believed. And then he said, I want the powers that you have. I want the power of the priesthood. I want the respect of the people. I want the power to perform miracles, to anoint the dying, to preach the word of God. I want the power to be a priest and to be able to be taken care of and have my financial needs cared for in the Holy Church because priesthood is a job. And I want to have that job, and I'm willing to pay you money to get it. Because after all, whenever you go to school, you have to pay money. And so I'm going to pay you money to get that job. And St. Peter says, Thou knowest not what spirit thou hast. It is the spirit of the devil. For God's power cannot be purchased with money. And that was Simon Magus. And Simon Magus then said, Please don't let these things fall upon me. He went back. But then he returned to his wicked ways of a magician, since he could not buy the priesthood. And he ended up dying a, a, a horrible death in his fake life as a magician, trying to deceive the people. 
And Simon Magus did not have a happy ending. So there are two kinds of priests. Simon, who goes before Christ and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And our Lord says to Simon, I will make you a fisher of men. And then there is Simon, who goes before Christ and says, I like the priesthood. I like the dignity. I like the power that you have. I want to be able to do the things that you do so that I will be able to survive and I will be able to do good as a priest. Because some people, you know, after all, they want to be carpenters. Other people want to be lawyers. Other people want to be farmers. Other people want to be judges and magistrates. And other people want to be priests. Now, a farmer, a judge, a magistrate, a carpenter, these are all things that you do in order to sustain yourself and also to be a good part of society. You do these things to sustain yourself, to survive. You do these things to also make good for the society and to take care of your family. These are noble occupations, and you do these works. Priesthood is not one of these works. This is one of the very subtle demonic attacks against the uh, church, which happened in the 1950s, and by good priests Good priests trying to fight against the problem of bad marriages and the problem of the attack against marriage. And these good priests unknowingly fell into the hand of Satan when they said, back in the 1950s, and they started to say this, they said, you must pray to God, what is your vocation? What does God call you to be? Does God want you to be married? Because marriage is a vocation. They raise marriage to the level of vocation. And priesthood is also another vocation. And maybe you're called to be a carpenter. And maybe you're called to be a lawyer. Maybe you're called to be a judge or a president. Maybe you're called, what does God call you to be? And so you got a list of all the calls, which are every conceivable occupation that can be known to man. If you look in the back of the old traditional brief we used to have, you've got all the patron saints. Patron saints of anvil makers, the patron saints of carpenters, the patron saints of every conceivable and inconceivable occupation. And one of them is priesthood. Now what happens when this is done? The priesthood becomes a means of sustenance. And the priesthood becomes another way to get to heaven. Because you can go to heaven by being a doctor. You can go to heaven by being a lawyer. You can go to heaven by being a carpenter. You can go to heaven in the in marriage. And you can go to heaven by trying to be a priest. Does God want me to be married to a beautiful girl in order to go to heaven? Does God want me to be a priest to go to heaven? Does God want me to be a monk to go to heaven? Does God want me to be a carpenter, a lawyer? Does God want me to be a bachelor? What does God want me to be? And so that I can live through this life comfortably and take care of myself. And then in the end, go to heaven. What's my job? Now, when this was done, the idea of Simon Magus entered into the Catholic Church as what a priest is. It's just an occupation to keep people alive. But our Lord Jesus Christ had never said that. What he said was that he, was, he, was, he came to set the world on fire. And what does he will but that it be enkindled? A thousand two hundred years later, one of his spiritual children, who had become an altar Christus, another Christ, was in the womb of his mother. And his mother saw a vision in a dream of a dog. And she said, There is not a baby in your womb, but a dog. And the dog had a brand of fire in his had a wooden brand in his teeth and fire on both sides, and the dog ran through the earth. And he ran through all the dry fields of the earth and caught the entire world on fire. And that, 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 uh, that man inside of his wound was called Dominic. And he became the founder of the Dominicans and he gave us the Holy Rosary. And with this weapon, the whole world is caught on fire. He gave us St. Thomas Aquinas. And with this weapon, the whole world of Catholic truth is caught on fire. And he gave us many other saints besides his own sanctity, which caught the whole world on fire for the divine truth and the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that the only answer to the troubles of the world equals the Lord and his holy mother, his holy church, his holy truth. Dominic did not want to become a priest to have an occupation. 
That's not why he became a priest. It was not a vocation. It was not an occupation. It wasn't something to do. He didn't think like Simon Magus. You know, it's so much better to be a priest where you can talk to people about our Lord and where you can give them confession and absolution than it is to be a carpenter where you can only build houses and maybe confessionals and maybe altars, but you can't do as much as a priest can. And so it's much better to be a priest. What about St. Fidelis? Fidelis was born in 1577. At that time, all the world was supposed to be Catholic. He was born in Europe. And the whole world is supposed to be Catholic. But the Protestant problem had arisen at that time. The Calvinists and all the various Protestants rose up at that time. And he said he desired to be a martyr. He desired to shed his blood for Christ. He studied civil law. He studied canon law. He studied theology. And then he began to switch from the school of the things of this world to the school of the things of God. The school of sanctity and he, he made great penances for himself, but he devoted himself with great charity to his neighbor. And guess what happened during the life of St. Fidelis? There arose a great plague. There arose a great plague after he was ordained a priest. And what did he do? What many priests at his time did not do. The plague was contagious, like the bubonic plague, and many were dying. He gave himself over completely to the care of those that were dying. He went to their bedsides. He nursed them while they were dying. He brought them the holy sacraments. He brought them food. He brought them shelter. He stayed by their bedsides so they would not die alone. And he gave himself over to them. And he was not ever become sick by this virus, by this plague. They knew the others that tried to stay away from it and be healthy. Some of them caught the plague anyway and died. What is the spirit of our priesthood? Priesthood is a vocation. And what is it? Our Lord Jesus Christ so spoke to this to the 12 apostles, including Judas, on Holy Thursday night, and he said, You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. That's a vocation. I have called. What does he call us to? He calls us away from the world, and he calls us to his own side, and he calls us to be apostles and missionaries and captains in his divine army. He calls us to capture the enemies of God, which are the souls in sin, and to fight against the Satan. We capture the souls in sin by bringing them back to the divine life, to the divine truth, and the divine love. And we fight against Satan by our own supernatural life that we live by saying the Holy Breviary each day and by, by saying the Holy Rosary and by saying celebrating the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and going around and striving to bring souls to Christ. It's not a job. It's not a way of sustaining oneself. Although our Lord did say the laborer is worthy of his hire. And it's true that the priest should be supported. That is true. It's true that he must also eat. But what is his duty? What is his responsibility? It is to go out and bring Christ to souls and souls to Christ. And it is not an occupation. It's not a job. It's not something to do. And for, unfortunately, those priests of the 1950s trying to fight against the decline of marriage tried to say that marriage is a vocation. Marriage is not a vocation. Every boy is supposed to be born. Grow up to maturity, marry a girl, have children, and pass on the faith to them and life to them, and then die. That's, what, that's not a vocation. That's human life. However, some souls are called away from that. They're called to something higher and better. And these are called by God. And they are not called by money. They are not called by intelligence. They are not called by their natural gifts. They are called by God, and God chooses all different levels. Fidelis, for instance, was extremely intelligent, like St. John Bosco. He was really, really smart. He had a photographic memory. He really learned very quickly all the things of uh, philosophy and theology. He was really intelligent. Others had a very hard time in school, like St. John Vianney. Others barely, barely passed and could be, barely were snuck through like St. Joseph of Cupertino. And others were all the levels in between. God chooses whomever he wishes according to his own disposition. And some are wise, but not many wise. And, and so that as our Lord says, St. Paul says, not many wise, 
Not many high in the world, but God chooses whom he wants to be fighters in his kingdom. And Fidelis, the word Fidelis means faithful, and that was what he wanted to be throughout his whole life, faithful, and that is what he was. And what did he do in a non-age of persecution? He preached the divine truth, and he condemned the errors and heresies of his people in his age. And what happened? They hated him. And there he, he preached the word of God. He preached the truth against the Orthodox of the East. He preached the truth against the Calvinists and Protestants. And he converted many to the, to the church of God. He converted many back to God. And because he preached the truth and because he preached it with the divine spirit of the Holy Ghost inside of him, with the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because he did this, he was hated. And we find this throughout all of history. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The servant is not greater than his master. Whoever preaches the true word of God must be hated. And they will bring up hatred about him. They'll bring up vomit about him. Like just recently, in the last few days, a nice vomit piece was brought out against the Society of St. Pius X by, uh, by Michael Varus, a uh, professor of vomit and by the church militant, and they brought out a vomit piece against the Society of St. Pius X, saying that the Society of St. Pius X is a dark, evil, wicked organization that has protected uh, sexual perverts over the last 40 years. And they claim that the Novus Ordo has all the bad priests, and we don't, but the Novus Ordo does, and it protected all these, and it goes through this, like this case, and that case, and the other case, it makes all kinds of innuendos, makes all kinds of associations, with a few facts and a whole lot of innuendos and a whole lot of, of twistings of facts that makes it sound so, wow, this is a dark organization. Going back to Archbishop Lefebvre himself, who rushed across the ocean in order to ordain an American priest. Why did he do that when this American priest left the priesthood and later on became a homosexual? And he's still alive as a homosexual with his partner. And that this is, this is the Society of St. Pius X, this priest ordained in 1980, who left the priesthood in 1984, and who, who was, uh, uh, what do you call it, was gone since those days, and now, and now decided to live another kind of life, an evil life. Narcissus Lefebvre ordained, he came all the way across to ordain this man. Why did he rush from Europe over to ordain this man? This is a wicked, wicked order of society, St. Pius X. And they got all the, the cameras making everything go back and forth, and they got quotations. One superior said, one priest came here who would later be arrested, who would have some kind of problem. We're happy to have Father so-and-so here as, a, as our fourth priest. Can you imagine that? A priest welcoming another priest into his priory and letting the people know. And everything is turned to wickedness and darkness. Now why is this another spit upon the Catholic Church? And what's interesting, who are the ones doing the spitting? Catholics. You see, Satan was on his way to close the church. He was running very fast, because angels are rather quick. And he was running really fast. Before he got there, the bishop already closed the church. Before he got there, the priest already closed the church. He was running in to tell the people lies. But before he got there, the priest and bishop already taught heresy to them. He was running there to teach them scandals, but before he got there, they were already scandalizing the sheep. Now we know that in the Holy Church of the last 2,000 years, starting with Judas Iscariot and Simon Peter, there will always be sinners in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And we also recognize from Simon Magus that there will be priests who are like Simon Magus. St. Peter prevented Simon Magus Simon the Magician from becoming a priest. But there are hundreds of thousands of Simons, Simon Maguses, who became priests, who bought their way into the priesthood, bought their way into the episcopacy, and bought their way into the papacy. One pope was unhappy with those that he gave money to, to elect him pope, but they did not elect him anyway. So his first act of pope was to take nine of the cardinals that did not elect him. He made a nice stone collar a millstone, put it around their necks. He read the sacred scripture that says, it is better that a man be cast into the sea with a millstone about his neck than you scandalize me. And you nine cardinals did not elect me, therefore you're a scandal. He had constructed nine millstones. He took the nine cardinals and drowned them in the Tiber. First act of Pope. 
not very holy. It was a wicked conclave followed by murder. That Pope was a true disciple, a true descendant of St. Peter, who now burns in the kingdom of hell, unless, of course, he repented of his great sin. And that there, there have been many sinners in our holy church, and there will always be sinners in our holy church. There, there, and, and as Bishop Sheen used to say, there is no church in which you can be a saint, unless in that same church you can also be a devil. If everybody, is, if everybody is good, well, then everybody is good. The Protestants can't be bad. They just believe in Jesus. And no matter how many sins they commit, it's all covered by believing in Jesus. So who cares about the Protestants? And they don't really believe in our Lord Jesus Christ anyway. And so we have a little scandal piece coming out the last few days. Another spit upon the church. Now the Society of St. Pius X, unfortunately, has fallen in the liberal path. And that, and that it has turned away from God as it, sh as it should not have done. The society that I belong to. That I had to stand up against my superiors. But not every single act of my superiors was wicked. Not every single thing they did was against God. And they also are human beings who are capable of making mistakes. They also have weakness in them. And that they are not to be condemned for every single mistake or every single seeming mistake that they made. What makes them worthy of condemnation is when they have not stood for the divine truth and when they have not promoted that truth to souls and when they have not given themselves over to charity to take care of souls. There will always be sinners in our holy church. If Adela stood up and he said, I will be faithful and I will, I will be faithful in the preaching of the truth against the errors and heresies of the time, the Calvinists, and he converted many of them and the Orthodox who shut themselves off from the church. And, and separated from the Pope. And he brought some Orthodox back to God. He brought Calvinists back to God. And he caused, therefore, the enemies of God to be very angry. And then he realized his, his desire will be fulfilled. And one day, some Calvinists said, Fidelis, we want you to come and preach to us in the town of Sevis. Come and preach to us. We want to hear the truth. And he came and preached to them. And they listened to his words, and they smiled. And on his way out, they went out, and they beat, they captured him on the road back to his home, and they killed him and beat him to death. And he became a martyr for preaching the divine word and the divine truth to souls that he knew would not listen. Do we preach only to those that listen? Do we preach only to those that love? St. Jerome says, I will preach the truth if everyone listens. I will preach the truth if many listen. I will preach the truth if few listen. I will preach the truth if no one listens, for God always hears, and he shall be my judge. At the old Father LeBlanc, the old French Canadian priest, former paratrooper, uh, what do you call it, uh, who, uh, yeah, a chaplain, in the in the in the in the Air Force of the Canada, one little miracle he had was a miracle of the rosary. He told he blessed the rosary of an airport pilot of a pilot in the war in Vietnam, and he said, "You take this rosary, keep this rosary, and it will protect you." So he had he got his rosary. He flew off on a mission, and he was shot down. And his parachute didn't work, and his ejection button didn't work, and so the the F four Phantom landed into the ground, exploded into pieces. His seat came out, his seat unbuckled, and he got up with his rosary in his hand, and he did not have a single scratch. Not even a bent fingernail, not even a sore muscle, nothing. But his plane was finished, but he and his rosary were fine. We must have faith in the confidence and protection of these things. But the old Father LeBlanc used to say, when you get up in the pulpit, out of his wheelchair, he get in the pulpit and say, I'm not here to please you. <laughs> that was the beginning of every sermon on Sunday. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to please him because he's going to judge me when I die. So if you're unhappy, I don't care. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then he would begin the sermon. But the fact is, what are we here to please? We're here to please God. And Vidalus was here to please God, and he knew that they were liars. He knew they were deceivers, but who knows, maybe one of those deceivers who would murder him and be the killer of him and make him a martyr, maybe one of them repented and went to God, and it was worth it. 
And if they didn't repent, it was still worth it because he spoke the truth. He spoke with a fire of the divine love to souls that would not listen to him. Because priesthood's not a job. It's not an occupation. If it is, then you don't go to a place like that. Because after all, if you're going to go to take on a job where they're not going to pay you, don't take on that job. If you're going to take on a job where they're going to kill you, I'm a carpenter and I fix the attics. So I'm going to fix the, my job is to fix the attic of Notre Dame Cathedral. So I'm in there fixing the attic on the day that it catches on fire by some accident caused by explosions by Jews and Masons. <laughs> and it burns down the cathedral while uh, Michelle Obama is sitting in the Seine drinking uh, some uh, whiskey and uh, liquor watching the fire burn. That's not a good day to be a carpenter in Notre Dame. You don't want to do that. However, if you're here to love God, if you're here to spread his holy faith, then whatever day that they decide to take me away, whatever day they decide to kill me, that day is a beautiful day. It's a good day to die. If it is a day in which I love God, if it is a day in which I preach his holy word, a day that I'm able to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass, a day that we're able to hold the Blessed Virgin Mary in our hands, have the rosary always in the pocket. Always have it. It protects. And have the scapular on. That's a beautiful day. And if it's a day of life, let it be a good day. If it's a day of death, it's an even better day. For well, that's a day of passing up into heaven. Priesthood is not an occupation. Simon Magus got it wrong. And Simon Magus is dead and in hell. And there are so many priests, so many priests that are tempted by the sin of Simon Magus. Now he was the extreme case because he tried to buy it only for his own benefit. But God allows us to suffer a little bit, to not have security in our futures, to not be secure in what's going to happen to us and how we're going to survive from day to day and week to week. But our Lord will always take care of us. Our Lady will always take care of us. But He allows there to be a few worries and a few struggles so that we decide, are you a follower of me? Are you ready to take up your cross and follow me? Are you ready to imitate me? How many people were paying attention to Christ's most beautiful sermon? The very the three-hour sermon that he gave on the cross, when he spoke seven last words, how many understood what he said? How many benefited that were there at that cross? Many of them struck their breasts that day. Remember at 3 p.m.? They struck their breasts and they went away. They didn't care about his beautiful words. It meant nothing to them. But when they saw the earthquake... And when they saw dead people rising, wow, this is serious. There's earthquake and there's dead people rising. Who cares about the earthquake? And those dead people that rose, they didn't really rise. They went right back into their tombs. They got up, peered to people, went back into their tombs. They just took a little station break, moved their place of death. That's all they did. But when Jesus Christ preached those seven last words, they weren't listening to him. And yet those words resonate until the ending of time. And the power of those words transformed the entire world. He wasn't speaking wise and intelligent words. And who was he speaking to when he was upon that cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was speaking to his Father. And that's the first word. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He was speaking to his Father, and that was the last word. And what was he speaking to his father? He was speaking about his love for the father. And later on, he would tell that Simon Peter, who had denied him three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I know you've been three and a half years in the seminary. I know I gave you all kinds of teaching. But I only have one question for you. Do you love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. Simon, feed my lambs. And I have another question for you, Simon. What is that, Lord? Do you love me? Now, he asked this question three times. Maybe it's an important question. And what does that question mean? What is a priest supposed to be? He is supposed to be a lover of our Lord Jesus Christ. The trouble of the world today is there aren't any lovers in it. Love is something that a man has. 
God bless all the beautiful ladies, but beautiful ladies are to be loved. They are not lovers. A man is a lover. The man is the one who must go out and love. And the woman must be lovable. When a woman is lovable, she transforms the world. She brings beauty and goodness and wonder and truth in the world by just being lovable, by just being beautiful. That's how she changes the world. But a man can be really handsome and it's just disgusting. He's just a fruitcake in the making. <laughs> the fact is that a handsome man is of no value. He can be really strong and that's really nice. He can take lots of steroids. Doesn't help. What must a man do? He must love. And the greatest lovers in the world are the priests of God. The second greatest lovers in the world are the monks. These are the lovers that are supposed to transform the world by carrying love to the very ends of the earth. And that's what Fidelis was. St. Fidelis carried love. Because Deus Caritas Est. God is charity. God is love. And so when we speak the word of truth, it is love that comes forth from the mouth. It is love that enters into the ears. Fides ex auditu, says St. Paul. Faith comes by hearing. And what do we hear? What the preachers speak. And what are the preachers supposed to speak? Those words that came from that holy cross. That's what they're supposed to speak. Those words that came from the divine lips. And they're not always nice words. Sometimes it is, ye brood of vipers. Sometimes it is, to your closest friend, get behind me, Satan. He didn't say that to Caiaphas, but he sure said that to St. Peter. Sometimes it's, get behind me, Satan. Sometimes it's, ye brood of vipers. Sometimes they're all having big problems. You know what? You're having big problems right now, and you're really worried, but you know what? I'm tired. <laughs> So I'm taking a nap. <laughs> and so the Lord took a nap. It was just a storm. They were just about ready to die. What's the big deal? I'm tired. I'm taking a nap. And so sometimes, sometimes love takes a nap on a boat in a storm. Sometimes love walks across the sea in another storm. Sometimes love is silent. And they speak to divine love and say, are you really a great king? Are you really a miracle worker? And sometimes he is silent at Jesus Tachebat. And sometimes love speaks and speaks most boldly and says, Thou Caiaphas, you are going to see the Son of Man coming with great power and majesty. And you are going to see him come to judge the living and the dead. And you shall be judged. Love has so many words. And they come out in so many different ways. And that is what truth is supposed to be. Truth comes out of the mouth and it comes out in love. And love will say so many things. For instance, when he's being crucified, Father, forgive them. When St. Stephen is being stoned to death, lay not this sin to their charge, O Lord. And yet in other times, condemnation. How do we know what to say? How do we know when to say it? What is supposed to guide us? Therefore, the love equals when Christ speaks to the priest and says, Simon, not Magus, Simon, son of John, Simon Bar-Yona, do you love me? Dost thou love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And there is where there are troubles in the world today because the priest of God, he doesn't love. And the priest of God is not feeding the lambs. He is not feeding the lambs. He is not feeding the sheep. And he believes that a priesthood is an occupation. And priesthood involves prudence. Priesthood involves wisdom. Now a very wise priest said to them, 11 wise priests said to Christ, Lord, it's a bad time to go to Jerusalem. Don't go. But Lazarus is sleeping. Good, let him sleep. Don't go. He's dead. All right, he's dead. Leave him dead. Don't go. You're losing the argument, Lord. If he's asleep, tis well. Let him sleep. If he's dead, it's too late. Let him die. And Christ says to him, 
to them, these apostles, I am glad that he's dead. He's your friend. You're glad that he's dead. What's going to happen when we die? I'm glad that he's dead. For this death is for your benefit. This death is so that you will learn about life. This death is to show you what power is. This death is to really show you my divine power and my divine love. And therefore this death is the most wonderful thing. I'm going to Jerusalem. They did not understand. But what did they do? Eleven of those men, not twelve. They didn't understand. But they did love. And as they had love in their hearts without a perfect understanding, they began to be real apostles. It is true, the mind is first and faith is first, but this faith must come out in my heart. It must come out in my desires. It must come out in my being. And that's what St. Fidelis did, where every priest has the truth before Vatican II. They were all taught the Catholic theology, but when it was taken from them, they gladly left it. But what about those that love the truth? They don't gladly leave it. They don't sadly leave it. They don't leave it. And not only do they not leave it, they take that which they love and they carry it into the world. When a young man is truly madly in love with a young girl and he proposes to her in the middle of New York City, what is he supposed to do? Spread the word. And when there is a marriage, what does a father do who has given his bride away to a young, wonderful young man? He wants the whole world to know about it. I want everybody invited to the feast. Because, we want, because the greater the love, the more we want invited to the feast. And how can there be a greater love than the love of Jesus Christ? How can there be a greater love than the love of the faith? So we want everyone invited to the feast. And if they're only going to come because they want to see a hanging, well, let them show up. They all came to a crucifixion. They all came to see blood. Let them come. Let them see blood. And when they're in the presence of the blood, let them hear what this blood is all about. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This day, this thief who's dying with me, it shall be with me in paradise. And the most wonderful gift that was ever made to all and any of us. Son, behold thy mother. Where do we find the mother? Where did we begin to put our eyes upon her? At the cross. And when did she put her eyes upon us? At the cross. It's not such a bad place to be. There is no safer place to be than with our mother. And John was very wise because he was there <laughs> with the mother. He was there. Peter was out weeping. It's nice to weep. But it's better to be with the mother. You should have wept the next day. It's better to be with the mother. But no matter, even though he wept, he wept with the right heart. And he was able to stay alive because he stayed with that mother. Peter did not abandon that mother. And Peter also was the son of that mother. And he became Saint Peter because of it. There are many wonderful things that happened in that last sermon of Christ. But no one was paying attention at the time. Well, the words still have power, and the words still spread. In St. Fidelis' final words, they were listened to by heretics. What were they words about? They were certainly words about the divine love. And about the cross. And he walked out, and those heretics that listened to his sermons and smiled in the church, he walked out of the church, he went back to his home. And he knew what home he was going to, because he told the people in advance, I am going to be martyred. Well, don't go. No. I run to the cross. I run to it. Christ ran to his cross. St. Andrew ran to his cross. St. Stephen ran to his cross. So I run to my cross. And then they killed him. And he died in great glory and became a great saint. The trouble in the world today is we need priests, we need monks, we need sisters, we need nuns who love God. And because they love God, they have a heart to feed the lambs, feed the lambs, and feed the sheep, and are ready to follow into the mouth of the lion. We are weak, we are, we are scared, we are foolish, not willing to do these things. So let's ask the Mother, our Holy Mother, to teach us how to stand and how to be faithful at the foot of the cross. 
and then to go faithfully carrying that cross to the ends of the earth. Close that God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.